Thank you to the BNT Infonet for this opportunity. This is a great gathering of people, some familiar faces, some, some new faces. Um, so it's my, my pleasure and honor to be able to speak to you today about, unfortunately, one of our most difficult complications after allogeneic transplantation. Now, how many of you out there are suffering from chronic graft versus host disease? Wow, yeah. So <laughs> some of this will not be new to you, and I, um, but for those of you who are, who are not familiar, I'll, I'll go through it. Um, so chronic graft versus host disease is, uh, is our most common late complication of, of allogeneic transplantation. It affects almost half of the people who have the allogeneic or the donor type of uh, stem cell transplant. It usually begins um, around four to six months after the transplant. Uh, this is distinct from acute graft versus host disease, which is related but somehow different in many ways in terms of symptoms and, and uh, side effects. Uh, it's the major cause for uh, a compromised quality of life after a transplant, which is it was hard because you've dealt with uh, a very life-threatening uh, malignancy or, or, or inherited blood disorder, and now you have another one you have to battle. But uh, there is hope uh, for, for improvement. Um, and Graft versus, chronic graft versus host disease can result in other medical problems um, as a consequence, not only of the, of the problem itself, but also of our medications that we use to try and combat it. Chronic graft versus host disease can affect almost any part of the body, and it's due to the donor's immune system that's gathering strength, realizing that it's in the wrong body. Um, many times we can... Uh, uh, we can teach the donor's immune system to do what it's supposed to do, which is to go out and fight germs and distinguish between things that are not, should not be in the body and things that are normal to the body. But when that immune system gets confused, it, 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 it rejects the body in many ways. You can call it a rejection. Um, it's similar to other autoimmune diseases. Autoimmune diseases are diseases where the, the, the person's own immune system is malfunctioning and it attacks the body instead of attacking germs. And some of these more common ones are lupus or scleroderma. Sjogren's syndrome is where people develop a reaction or an, an immune attack against their salivary and their lacrimal, their tear-producing glands that are causing dry mouth and dry eyes. It also can affect the liver. Uh, I'm sorry, primary biliary cirrhosis is an autoimmune disease affecting the liver very much like some of our chronic graft versus host disease patients who have liver problems. What does it look like? Well, um, uh, the most commonly affected organs are the skin, the mouth, the eyes, and the liver. It can less commonly affect the lungs, the intestine, causing um, weight loss, uh, inability to, to, to gain weight, even, even with people who have good appetites. It can affect the joints and the genital tract. Rarely, it can affect the kidney, uh, the nervous system, uh, and the pancreas. So really any part of the body can be affected. Now we like to protect uh, confidentiality as doctors, so just in case you might recognize this mouse, we've protected uh, this face. But you know, we learn a lot from mice, and mice um, have, there's been a lot of bone marrow transplants going on in mice, uh, and some of them make it, some of them don't, but they all teach us something, and it's very important that we do research and this is a mouse affected by chronic graft versus host disease. And you can see the fur is, um, is, is shedding and the body weight compared to a healthy mouse is, is quite low. Uh, but we are testing, always testing new medicines on mice and many times these uh, medicines find their way to clinical trials. Um, so we, we learn a lot from mouse graft versus host disease. This is a patient of mine from many years ago who does have severe chronic graft versus host disease of the skin. And this causes a, a loss of the normal texture of the skin. It's very shiny. Um, you, would, you, you, uh, you don't have hair growth on the legs and it can be discolored and, and her, her joints are very stiff uh, because of the tightness of the skin and also the layer underneath the skin called the fascia. So this is, the, this is probably uh, one of the more severe forms of graft versus host disease. So the impact of chronic graft versus host disease is quite varied, and those of you who are battling it, some of you are able to go about your daily life, and others are quite compromised long term, and you know this well. It, it affects your quality of life. It can sometimes compromise the ability to work, 
uh, financial challenges, need for continued medical follow-up, even though you've been told your blood counts are good and your cancer is gone, you still have to go to the, your physicians, your transplant doctors, or your local physicians to get care for your chronic graft versus host disease. Many medications. This is probably one of the most challenging aspects of treating chronic, chronic graft versus host disease is that the medicines can be uh, very dangerous as well. So we have to balance the activity of the graft versus host disease with the, with the side effects of the medicines like, like prednisone. Prednisone is our best medicine, but it does have side effects that can be equally uh, uh, harmful. Graft versus host, chronic graft versus host disease affects the ability of the immune system to function normally. And part of this is because uh, we use medicines to try and dampen the, the, the uh, immune dysfunction, but also the chronic graft versus host disease prevents the immune system from really spreading its wings and doing its job properly. So we have to be careful. Uh, patients with chronic GVHD have to be careful for in, with infections, just like they did when they were going through the transplant themselves in, in the midst of the transplant. And unfortunately, some people over the long haul um, die of chronic graft versus host disease. So this is a study by Fraser published a few years ago, and there's some good news and bad news here. The good news is that, uh, well, the bad news, starting with the bad news, is that you can see in, if all different uh, aspects of health are affected adversely. This is the percent, uh, the prevalence of, um, uh, of, of compromise in these health functions with people with graft-versus-host disease. You can see it's much worse. Uh, it, when you have graft versus host disease. But the good news here is that in patients who've recovered from chronic graft versus host disease in the gray bars, it goes back, the, the level of functioning or the comp degree of compromised uh, effects on health is similar to those who never had graft versus host disease. So if we can get, a, get on top of this, and many times if we just patient, uh, the graft versus host disease will slowly, slowly ease its way out of the body and then we, the study shows that you can go back to having a similar quality of life as those who never had it at all. So that's, that's encouraging. Now, maybe some of you who've been through a bone marrow transplant remember the doctor saying, well, if you have a little bit of graft-versus-host disease, that's a good thing. And the reason is because that graft-versus-host disease means that the donor's immune system is gaining strength. It is attacking the body, which we don't want. That's what the disease is. But it's also giving you protection from cancer coming back. And that is, that is the silver lining of graft versus host disease. And we've studied this and we learned that in those people who do get graft versus host disease, both acute and chronic, their likelihood of the cancer coming back is much less. So we're okay with a little bit, but we're not okay with more severe forms of graft versus host disease because that can be in the long haul as as dangerous as the, as the cancer itself. So who, who's particularly at risk for getting chronic graft versus host disease? Well, we know that if you're older at the time of your transplant, older being you know, over 40 or 50, you're more likely to get chronic graft versus host disease than if you're four or five. Children, the children's, the pediatric patients, they do get graft versus host disease, but it often is uh, it's easier to treat. Uh, and a, a children's body, a child's body, is much more uh, uh, better equipped to develop a new immune system. That's what they're doing during their, their pediatric, their childhood years, is they're gaining uh, an immune, what we call an immune repertoire. A, uh, I also often use the, the analogy of a keyboard on a piano. Many of my patients will remember me talking about that. Each key representing the ability to fight a germ. And when you're born, you have an empty keyboard. By the time you're 15 or 16, your keys are almost pretty well filled in. Now, when we do a bone marrow transplant, we wipe out all the keys again. And so if you're a child, a child's much better equipped to fill in the keys. Adults, we're not as well equipped. Um, so that's why uh, the, sometimes the, the, uh, the process uh, goes poorly and we see graft versus host disease. Um, we, we always try to find a match match donor. Things are changing a little bit these days. We're now finding better ways of doing transplants with mismatched donors, but for many years as a, as a bone marrow transplanter, we know that we tried to find match donors either in the family ideally or from the National Marrow Donor Program because if the donor's immune system is similar to the recipient's, that risk of graft versus host disease is going to be less. Now, 
something that maybe people don't realize is that we, we don't like to transplant uh, female donors into male patients. And the reason has to do with the XY kind of thing. So um, uh, the, the Y chromosome is different. And the Y chromosome, females have never seen. So Y chromos some genes are made by the y, on the Y chromosome. If you have a female donor, the, uh, the recipient uh, the, the, the new the female immune system will actually recognize some of these uh, Y uh, linked chromosomes and uh, and genes and proteins and cause a, a reaction. So we try to sex match the donor and recipient uh, and recipients of, of, of blood stem cells versus bone marrow seems to be a risk factor for chronic graft versus host disease. Now we we do at our center a lot of cord blood transplants. Cord blood comes from a brand new human being, a, a baby's, baby's blood that's in the placenta. And uh, although there are downsides to cord blood, one of the, one of the positives of cord blood is that uh, the risk of chronic graft versus host disease is less. So uh, we're trying to uh, exploit some of those benefits of cord blood and use it, use it in adult patients. Uh, so we talked a little bit about chronic graft versus host disease and why it occurs. And, and it really, as I mentioned, is the, is the confusion on the part of the donor's immune system in the recipient's body. And if you look, if you look down into a, a more granular, more detailed uh, uh, questioning of why that happens, we, we find that there's two um, immune cells, uh, lymphos two different types of lymphocytes, T lymphocytes and B lymphocytes, that are driving this graft versus host disease. T lymphocytes are uh, the uh, infection-fighting cells that typically go after viruses. B lymphocytes are the lymphocytes, the parts of the immune system that make antibodies. And it's actually somewhat new, and we have a, we have a scientist at Duke who's particularly interested in, in, in helping us understand why B lymphocytes are responsible for causing graft-versus-host disease. Now, sometimes if you get sick, you rear up, you, you fire up your donor's immune system, and that can trigger graft-versus-host disease. The viruses that are hard for the, the donor's immune system to, to battle will activate the donor's immune system and trigger a GVHD event. And in, in, in what we call the, this inflammation that, as a result of the, the inf infection uh, is call, are called inflammatory cytokines and that's, that's one of the driving forces. So as I mentioned, depending on the way, the age, the type of transplant, the degree of matching, uh, anywhere from 10 to 50 percent of the pers of the patients will get graft versus, chronic graft versus host disease. Um, it usually occurs in the first year, um, and if someone has experienced acute graft versus host disease, they're more likely to develop chronic graft versus host disease. Um, now, uh, what we've seen uh, su surprisingly is that people can go for many years after the bone marrow transplant and then start to develop it even three, four, five years later. That's less common, but we have observed that too. How long does it last? Well, that's quite variable. Um, it usually lasts a while. And uh, so when we see chronic graft versus host disease, we, at least I tell my patients, I let them know that this is something we're going to be dealing with for possibly up to two years, two to three years. It doesn't need to be active the whole time. We can sometimes control it, get it, get it pretty much in remission, but the medicines are lasting a little while to make sure it doesn't come back. Eventually, it can fade away, uh, but sometimes residual damage to the skin or the liver or the intestine can last uh, and be permanent. Um, about 15% of the people who get graft-versus-host disease uh, will have it for very many, many years. So treatments. Treatment is an area of, of intense research right now. We, we, we know that prednisone, which is the first line of treatment, works very well. And if we could use high doses of prednisone in everybody who had chronic graft versus host disease until it went away, I think we'd be quite effective at treating it. But of course, we can't do that. Prednisone is very damaging to the body over the long haul. Low doses, okay, we can deal with that. High doses, we can't do that. So we, we try to, to use prednisone uh, liberally at the beginning, sparingly over the long haul, and trying to uh, add to the regimen other medicines that are not as harmful to the body. We, of course, would like to just treat the, the, the symptom, the, the GBHD itself. So if GBHD is affecting the skin but nowhere else in the body, 
we like to use topical creams, uh, eye drops if it's affecting the eyes, because this causes the least damage to the body itself. Um, and, and steroid creams are, in fact, very effective in some people. That doesn't cause harm to the bones or the uh, intestine or other things that, that, the, that the steroids can do. Uh, if prednisone's not working, that's where we really have a short list of, of, of options. But we do uh, quite a bit use a, a treatment called extracorporeal photophoresis. This is a, a treatment that looks that is done by a machine that looks a lot like a dialysis machine or a napheresis machine. In fact, some of you are familiar with that. Uh, the machine uh, filters out some of the blood and it treats the blood, tries to, to modify the, the immune cells in the, in, the, in the blood that it's treating to go in and, and dampen the, uh, the, the response and dampen the chronic graft versus host disease. There are a lot of other immunosuppressive medications that, that are tried. Um, unfortunately, there have, some of them have effectiveness, but others we try and they don't work. So we do need more. Uh, we need newer and better medicines to treat gra chronic graft versus host disease. Long-term complications, I mentioned a little bit, have to do with the, the risk of infections. That's one of our most uh, worrisome parts of, of, of graft versus host disease because of its effect on the immune system and because of the medicine's effect on the immune system. Uh, nutrition, poor dentition, oftentimes graft versus host disease affects the salivary glands. It's harmful for teeth to have dry mouth, uh, so dentition can be um, a problem, your teeth can be a problem. Uh, secondary cancers of the mouth, skin, or thyroid gland can occur, and lung damage over the long haul can, can occur if, it is, uh, if the GVHD is re um, refractory to treatment. Infections, this is a study uh, published a few years ago about the types of infections that occur. We have bacterial, fungal, and viral infections. Uh, but with time, uh, as the GVHD gets better, the infection rate goes down, which is, which is, which is encouraging. The main infections are bacterial, uh, fungal, and uh, one of the, one of the uh, pneumonia uh, infections called pneumocystis that you might be familiar with from the transplant side. Viruses also are, are, are common in people who have chronic GVHD. Shingles in particular is, uh, can be a very... Uh, uh, painful experience for many people. We often, in people who are, tr are getting active treatment for chronic GVHD, will use preventative antibiotics, and one in particular, uh, just simple penicillin, because we know that uh, people with chronic GVHD are more likely to get uh, strep, uh, pneumococcal, deep-seated pneumococcal infections, particularly strep infections. Uh, so we use penicillin uh, to prevent that from, from uh, causing problems. So I'll finish by just telling you that we have a lot of, there's a lot of hope on the horizon for, for treatment. We are very active in, uh, in, in studying new drugs, new medicines for chronic graft versus host disease. This effort is led in large part by Stephanie Sarantopoulos, one of my colleagues at Duke. She's looking at two new medicines, uh, one of them called fostamatinib for patients who are not responding to prednisone and another medicine called entosplatinib. This is a study that's taking place throughout the country actually. Uh, and these are on your uh, handout, uh, but these are for patients with newly diagnosed chronic graft versus host disease. So we're making progress. Hopefully these studies will, uh, these and other studies, there's other national studies uh, coming on, on board uh, throughout the country. So if you have chronic graft versus host disease and you want to look into some options at Duke, uh, Ryan Virgil, and I have his card. He's our protocol uh, coordinator. I can, I, uh, you can contact him about those studies. Or you can go to clinicaltrials.gov and, and search chronic graft versus host disease if you're not from the, from the North, North Carolina or from other places and see if there's a site closer to you where uh, studies are taking place. Preventative measures, as you probably have been told, you want to look for antibiotics, uh, uh, antibiotics, sunscreen to prevent skin graft versus host disease, maintaining bone health to combat uh, prednisone effects, and routine uh, screening from your doctor. Those are all very important. So I'll finish by saying um, that chronic graft versus host disease affects about half of our stem cell transplant recipients. Multiple organs are affected, including the skin, mouth, and eyes as the most common. Uh, and treatment is with prednisone at the, at the outset. It's our best uh, treatment. 
but other immunosuppressive medicines can be added to that to try and reduce the dose of, graf of prednisone. Uh, and we need to be closely aligned with uh, uh, the patients, not only at the transplant center, but with the, with the local physician to make sure that, um, that the best, very best care is provided. So I'll end there. I'll have time for questions. Thank you again for your attention. And Thank you very much, Dr. Hortz. Um, we will now take questions. Um, we have 30 minutes for Q&A. Um, there's one mic in the back. Someone's holding a mic over there, and then I'll hold the mic on the front, so we'll alternate back and yes. forth. Yes. Um, my daughter is 15 years out with chronic GVHD, and um, she's pretty much done with prednisone. The doctor suggested that she move her prednisone up to 30 milligrams a day, and she refused. She's 35 years old now, so she's an adult. In your slides, you suggest there are other immunosuppressants that are available to combat chronic GBHD. And the other question I have, has the FDA approved the photophoresis process? Last I heard, it wasn't approved. Uh, your, your first question has to do with other immunosuppressants. There are uh, other immunosuppressants. We borrow from other disciplines such as the kidney transplant uh, group or the uh, rheumatologists who deal with autoimmune diseases and we, we, we trial many of these, these approved medicines. They're not approved for chronic graft versus disease. There are no medicines, including photophoresis, as you mentioned, which is not approved for chronic graft versus disease. But uh, in practice, we have, uh, we're very accustomed as bone marrow transplant doctors to use medicines that are not, that are off label. And we have had pretty good success in getting it uh, uh, approved by the, by the provider, including extracorporeal photophoresis. I, I can't remember the last time I've had a patient who, uh, I, actually I can, it does happen. But for the most part, people who have chronic GVHD who who, who want to try photophoresis, um, it, can, it can be done, it can be paid for. You mentioned higher doses of prednisone and lower doses. What's high to you or low? Sorry, which? What's a high dose of prednisone and what's low? Uh, well, I mean, high doses are probably anything over 25 to 30 milligrams over the long haul can, can be hard on the body. I found that some people are tolerated better than others. Some people have a lot of side effects to the you know, 30 plus milligrams, others don't. I, in, in a lot of my patients, I'm, I've gotten them down to say 10 milligrams or sometimes 10 milligrams every other day. That would be what I consider low dose and, and I feel pretty comfortable at 10 milligrams a day uh, in, in be able to control some of the ill effects of the, of the steroid. In um, graft-versus-host disease, is it normally in one area of the body? Like if it's in the eyes, it will kind of like stay in the eyes or can it spread, um, develop, or are you more likely to get it again if you get rid of it? like the lady in the picture that had it on her back and her leg, will it spread throughout the body? Or it's, it's, Anything's possible with this disease, but in, in my experience, it usually affects one or two organs. And, and, and that's where the vulnerability seems to be in the, of the body. That's where the attack is focused. I, I don't usually see, although I have, but I don't usually see someone who starts out with skin graft versus host disease and it gets treated and then Six months later, it's affecting the liver or the intestine or the lungs. But, but, uh, so, but it, it can happen, unfortunately. Let me take this person first right over here. Um, with ECP, um, where is it effective? Like um, all sort of the different systems that GVHD can affect, or is it sort of some systems more than another? Good question. The, the ECP is, is sort of like a, a taking prednisone in the sense that it, it modifies the immune system throughout the body. Um, 
And uh, we, we don't have really good data on, on which organs in particular it helps. In my experience, people with skin, uh, GVHD, uh, benefit the most from ECT. It's not a magic bullet. I don't, mean to, I don't want you to think that that's the, the cure-all. It, it does help us, allow us to reduce the prednisone dose, which is my, in my practice, my main goal is to get people off prednisone. So it's very inconvenient, but it's very safe. And if we can get the steroid dose down, and, and uh, uh, that's, that's, that's a win as far as I'm concerned. So it, does affect, it can help any organ in the body that's affected by chronic GVH. Have you ever seen um, uh, GV, chronic GVHD affect the skin in terms of appearance of a vitiligo or removal of the a pigment of yes. the skin besides the rosacea that I yes. saw on the picture? Yes, absolutely. I've seen that, particularly in people of African descent. Um, I've seen that uh, multiple times, yes. Um, if you were to rank the GVHDs, um, would you rank the lung as being the most serious? And what's the prognosis for that? <laughs> uh, yeah, I would say that uh, that is one of the most dangerous uh, uh, manifestations of chronic GVHD. Um, the prognosis is variable, just like anybody who has chronic GVHD, I tell them there's always hope that it will finally go away. Um, but but anybody who gets it can al also be set on a course where it continues to get worse. You can live with, with severe graft versus associated disease of the skin longer than you can of the lung. So um, so it, it that is a, a particularly dangerous um, um, form of it. Um, you said that GVHD uh, affects lungs, and I was wondering what are the symptoms of or what does it do to the lungs? Well, the, the symptoms, the, the early symptoms can be a, a, just a nagging dry cough that, that doesn't go away. Um, and, uh, and then as people get farther from their transplant, they want to get more active. They want to exercise, and that starts to limit them. They start to think, well, you know, I'm, I'm doing everything right. I'm exercising, but I can't. I'm still tired. People often don't realize what's going on. They say they're tired. I get that a lot. But in fact, what it is is they just, they're just not getting enough oxygen to their tissue. The lungs aren't functioning well enough. Um, and so uh, if it keeps going, then eventually, you know, you go to the doctor and they say, well, they, they do the, the oxygen saturation. They can say, you know, your, your saturations are low. There must be a problem. And that's what triggers a workup. So you do some x-rays or CT scans and you can start to see and, and then, of course, the, the, the pulmonary function test that many of you are familiar with can show a decline. It's a little tricky because, um, you know, a bone marrow transplant is an intense procedure, and it affects all, all the organs in some way. So it's not uncommon, it's common, I should say, to see someone, someone's lung function after a bone marrow transplant be not quite as good as it was before. Many people can, it's just a number. They say, oh, that's interesting, but I'm doing fine. I can do everything I want to do. Um, others, that might be an early sign of chronic graft versus host disease in the lungs. So we have to follow it closely if we're, we have a concern. It, it seems like, well, first of all, I've been going through treatment for GVH for uh, over three years now. Uh, part of it's been ECP, steroids, and then immunosuppressants. And, and so much of uh, how, how long we continue this is based on symptoms I report or how I feel, but h how do you determine when, you know, we've gotten all the benefit out of this we can and it's time to stop? Or uh, how do you go through like a maintenance process to try to keep it from coming back? Because I, I got it in remission for about three months and then it came back and we started all over again. So h how much is enough? I, I think it's a hard question. I think a lot of it does depend on, you know, your quality of life and how it's affecting your quality of life. I mean, the medicines have their downsides too. So I, I try to sit down and have a long conversation about, you know, what, what, is, 
what's important and what's, what really needs to be treated and what maybe you could just let go. Um, I mean, some chronic graft versus host disease really affects the quality of life to a great degree and we need to treat it. I mean, I, and it's going to go away eventually. I think that given the fact that it's very encouraging that you got into remission, uh, it's, it seems like it's a bit stubborn. Um, maybe some, you know, low dose uh, maintenance type treatment like low dose prednisone or maybe another medication might prevent this waxing waning um, business. But um, I, I think that's a personal uh, conversation, personal decision for each patient as to what, when to stop treating it. Is there any other uh, treatment for skin cancer, squamous, and all of that besides surgery? Where's the Where's the question? Oh, there. <laughs> um, you know, yes, uh, skin squamous cell carcinoma needs to be monitored very carefully after a bone marrow after any kind of cancer treatment, particularly after a stem cell transplant. Um, and if it's identified early, it needs to be removed um, uh, for sure. There's no other way to, to get rid of the skin cancer. Radiation for skin? For yeah, skin? radiation therapy for skin cancer. I don't think so. I don't think so. Hi. So um, my husband um, was originally referred to you a long time ago, but he wound up with Dr. Chow. So oh. we're going to catch up with you afterwards. But um, it's very interesting. He he does very well on five milligrams of steroids. And, of course, anything that perturbs his immune system, bam, whatever it is, anything. Mm -hmm. And the interesting thing is he can have this brewing infection, you know, small infection, whether it's a bronchial thing or whatever. And as soon as he gets the antibiotics, that's when it goes off to the races. Really? And that's why I wanted you to talk a little bit more about the same, the cytokine process, because there are certain antibiotics that keep stuff from growing, and then there are others that break stuff apart. And is there some kind of cytokine activity that could be going on there? Well, inflammatory cytokines are a critical component to the immune system. I mean, when when the immune system is challenged, the uh, the, the the immune cells, the lymphocytes rush to the site and they start attacking and they release inflammatory cytokines which brings more inflammatory immune cells to the site. And I, I don't know, I, I don't quite know how or why antibiotics could be triggering this. Now, anything that, like for example, if you have an allergic reaction, that will trigger the release of inflammatory cytokines. So, I mean, if that, that may be it. Um, other medicines could be pro-inflammatory, but antibiotics typically not. So I don't know, I, I don't know whether you, the attribution to the antibiotics is, is correct or whether that maybe once the antibiotics started, the inflammatory cytokine levels have, have been uh, reach a point where it's causing this, this flare. Yeah, that's unusual. I don't, I, I, and it's, it's di many different types of antibiotics too. Yeah, that's, un that's new to me. I haven't heard of that. Um, <coughs> you mentioned that the, uh, <coughs> among the most common manifestations of chronic GVHD is <coughs> mouth and eyes. <coughs> Are you speaking of dry mouth and, and dry eyes? And is the best remedy over-the-counter uh, teardrops and uh, stuff like biotin? Is that a permanent thing, or does it take care of itself over time? Um, it can, can it get worse than dry eyes, dry mouth? Yeah, with, it with can get worse. And, and, and also, can it get better on its own? Yeah, the answers are yes. Everything's, anything's possible with chronic GVHD. Dry eyes and dry mouth mean that that's what we call keratoconjunctivitis sicca. That means that the lacrimal tear-producing glands and the salivary glands have been the attack, the, the, um, the, the source of the, of the immune attack. Um, but it can be worse. It can affect the, the mucosa, the, the cheeks and the, the gums and the lips. That can be a, a manifestation of chronic GVHD, and that's different. Um, sometimes they go together, sometimes they don't. Uh, that, that can get better, for sure. But, um, but some of the damage that's done to the tear-producing and the salivary-producing glands 
is irreversible. And uh, then you're just, you really have to use lubrication, both artificial tears, artificial saliva, um, to manage. Um, what are the symptoms of GVHD with the um, liver? The liver, oftentimes you don't even have any symptoms. Oftentimes you just come in for your appointment and we do the blood test and we can see that the liver is irritated. Uh, it's not until it really gets bad where you start to find that your urine turns dark, your skin might have a yellow tint to it like a little bit of jaundice. Um, sometimes I find people have itching with liver graft versus host disease. Um, and that's usually, that's often um, one of the first signs of it. That doesn't, usually goes away, but itching is... Itching well. everywhere, like back and stuff like that? Everywhere, yeah. yeah. And what about the intestines? The intestine is, that, that has side effects. So some people just can't gain weight. They just have very little appetite uh, and have difficulty gaining weight. Sometimes uh, diarrhea is a manifestation of, of chronic GVH uh, and poor nutrition. Hi, me again. Um, I've sort of had um, worsening GVHD kind of over like the past decade, <laughs> you know, just kind of attacking more and more systems. But um, what's interesting is my immune system is really strong. Um, my doctor is actually kind of impressed with my immune system, especially what it's kind of been conquering lately. Um, but I'm almost, you know, I'm curious as to um, if sort of a strong immune system could mean that, you know, sort of my donor marrow is kind of maybe attacking my body a bit stronger or something like that. Like, does that, I don't know, make any kind of sense? Where, where, what is your GVHD affecting? Um, uh, gut, skin, uh, joints, um, have it mildly, like in my mouth and eyes, and um, kind of like bladder and stuff like that too. So just kind of been accumulating. Well, I, I first want to compliment your doctor of making sure of finding that balance. I mean, there is there is activity, but it's that's not being treated to the extent that your immune system is, is paralyzed. We can do that. We have the ability, but that would be counterproductive because then you trade one problem for another. Right. Um, so I think your doctor is doing a good job of finding the balance. Um, Hopefully, this will be a waxing and waning process that will eventually, with time, fade away and, and move out. But, but yeah, I think that uh, immune functions. You're also probably taking some precautions. I'd imagine you're you're not doing a lot of having a high, lot of high risk exposures. I hope and and so you, there's a lot you can do to prevent infections. So uh, and then you know that's we can measure. We can do. Uh, blood tests to give a sense for the strength of the immune system, but the most important measure of a strong immune system is what you're describing. You're not getting recurrent infections, and that's that's very hopeful, and promising. I, I I think you have a lot to lot to re lot of reasons to be hopeful about the future. Okay, thank you. Yeah, you mentioned uh, rebuilding the immune system in the keyboard scenario. At what point and can our doctors tell us that uh, what sometime, if any of those keys may not be able to be replaced? The, the analogy falls apart a little bit in the sense that we can't measure how many keys you have for sure. Um, that's something that's not really, I mean, that's really not something we're able to measure. The, the key test, as I mentioned, is, is your ability to fight infections and, and go through, go, you know, a six month period or a year period without any major uh, problems. Now, you can get a cold and everybody gets colds, but if you're able to battle off that cold and, and in, in a week or two feeling better, that's a sign that you're working with a good number of keys. Um, you might be missing a key, you know, for a long time, but if you don't, as long as you don't get that infection that, that, has, that corresponds with the missing key, you should be fine. Um, since I had my transplant seven years ago, I've been dealing with a fatty liver. Does that have any Thing to do with GVH? I don't think so. That's typically not one of the associations with chronic GVHD. I've got my uh, one year anniversary coming up for my uh, bone marrow transplant. And so for a year, I haven't done any gardening or any fishing or done anything that we normally do. Um, is this something that, how long is the norm for not doing, well, like yeah. gardening or, you know, doing plants and 
and being around the bacteria like in the ocean? Is this something that's going to go on forever, or is this something that? Well, I don't a think so. Limit? I think I think as you you know as you visit with your doctor and you you readdress this issue, uh, you know he or she will take into account what medicines you're on, how serious your GVHD is, what your blood counts look like, and then mm -hmm. then your doctor can make uh, suggestions. I mean, you know, my feeling is that we we can only we 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 err on the side of caution. You know, ultimately, it's your choice what you do. We don't hold the key to. We don't really know for sure when it's safe to do something and when it's not safe to do something. We can make suggestions and we can make predictions, but um, really, it falls down to when when you think you're ready to do it. <laughs> it's really your call. If the immune system is, we're being told that the immune system is nearly. I mean, it's, it's recovering well, it's getting close to being back to normal. It's about six, seven months after transplant, but we continue to battle CMV. Can, why? Well, that, that's a perfect example of a missing key, and that's a really mysterious thing. Sometimes it does mean that your immune system still is globally very diffusely weak. I mean, we see the CMV very, very commonly in the early days after a transplant, and other times, we see people who are far, many months out who otherwise seem to be doing fine, but they have a particular hole in the immune system that just can't, won't fill in. And I, I have to be honest, I don't know why that happens. I've seen that too. Um, uh, but but uh, I, think, I think it'll eventually figure it out. If you were, if you were you know, 30 years younger, you probably would be better, better at filling in those holes. But for some reason, you just can't seem to fill that hole. One, one possibility, and, and maybe your doctor has explored this, is that, is that your donor had never seen CMV either. Um, that's one, that those people are often at more risk, higher risk for recurrent CMV infections than, than getting a donor who who's already has that key in place and transferring that to you. CMV is cytomegalovirus. It's a virus that, um, that uh, is commonly, we, many of us have already been exposed to it during childhood. It, it's like the chickenpox virus that lays dormant in the body. And when the immune system is weak, it can activate itself and, and you can detect it in the blood. Hi. I have uh, chronic swelling of the joints, mostly hands and, and uh, shoulders as well and, and uh, when I'm not on prednisone I have difficulties like straightening my arms or my legs it feels like tendons are very tight is that is prednisone probably the best thing for that or it is um, the best thing yeah for sure it's the most effective for any form of chronic graft versus host disease yeah and is is swelling the most common things with joints when you refer to GVA to the joints uh, I don't know if it's the most common, but uh, but seen for sure. And uh, I've I've actually in, in people who's that who in, in whom that's their main manifestation of chronic GVHD, I've asked for help from rheumatologists because this this is often um, more very much related to, to diseases that they treat, particularly rheumatoid arthritis. Right. So I they they sometimes have. Uh, Tools th that we don't we aren't, aren't as comfortable with me in particular personally and some some transplant doctors are but but they they have I've had some patients with similar problems that a rheumatologist has done a great job with. Oh, good. Okay, thank you, Dr. Horowitz. I appreciate another chance to get Hi. to thank you for <laughs> all you and your team did for me. But I have a question. Um, are we closer to getting a shingles vaccination that's not live yeah, that we can take? Yeah, it's a great question. I have been waiting for that for so long. We, we, did, we participated in national studies probably two or three years ago, and I don't, I don't know why it's taking so long to get through the FDA. This is one of the big problems, I think, of, of some of, the, of our approval process is that, because um, I, I mean, I, I think that it's there. I think the technology exists, and we need it badly. We really do. I don't know when it's going to be approved, but it's, it's coming. And when it does, you're going to get it. Everybody's going to get it. Um, I deal with it in my skin, like, constantly, which is probably what most people do. Clobetasol works best for me, but my insurance company will only let me have a 15-gram tube. 
which is about the size of my middle finger. And I get it from my toes to my <laughs> armpits. And I'd like to know if there's anything else. Clobetasol does work best for me, but I have fought for one year with United Healthcare about getting at least a 30 gram tube, and they also make it in a 60 gram tube. But I can only get a 15 gram tube every seven days. So when I have a flare, um, a 15 gram tube lasts me three days maximum. So I feel like if I'm not able to get it in control once and for all, then the chances of me it reoccurring are even better. And I'd like to know if you maybe have a better suggestion for an Well, I don't know. I, there okay. are a lot, lots and lots of high-potency topical steroid creams uh, that could work just as well as clobetazole. I, I, I assume you've asked your, your, your pharmacist or, or United Healthcare which, if they have, they would approve. Triamcinolone. Yeah. Yeah, that's... Very frustrating. Yeah, I, I mean, unfortunately, this is a story I've heard before where people just need a medicine and they either can't get it or can't get enough. And I, I'm sorry that I don't. We are going to take only one more question, and then after that, we will break for lunch. But uh, Dr. Horitz will be here after the session if you have any follow-up questions. So the last question goes to you. More statement than a question. Uh, we've been dealing with uh, GVH for the past 27 years. So folks, they're saying like uh, after two years, two months, whatever, will it get better? The thing is, if you have it, you're going to have it. Understand that. But we raised two girls. One's a Marine, 29 years old, and one's an artist. You learn to live with it. We were up to about, I will say, 95% of normal for many years. Until two years ago, when we got another case of double pneumonia, which we get like every couple of years, and we got used to it after a while. You just get double pneumonia, you live with it, and keep going. This time, age caught up with us. And now my wife's on oxygen. But she's still functional. The thing is, you're going to have these little battles from now on. The thing is, it's not going to stop you. It's going to slow you down. It's not going to stop you. When we had ours done, it was back when they called the Dark Ages. Trust me, what they have today out the outside is amazing. The thing is, you're going to have GVH. Understand it, deal with it, drive on. Thank you.